Sorry about the lighting and the, the image. Uh, I've been having troubles uh, with my uh, lighting and getting this camera settings just right. Uh, this video has been taking too much time to really sit here and deal with all these little technical details. But uh, it's not the image that you need to see that's important. It's the words that come out. I hope you can understand what I'm saying. And um, this is a response. Uh, I'm making this response uh, to True Surge. Uh, ten more questions Christians can't answer. This is a follow-up to the other one I did to his other video, Ten Questions Christians Could Not Answer which I answered those questions, now I will answer to the best of my ability these these ten questions. But first, I would like to say a couple of things. Uh, I think this True Surge is a, a funny character. He does have some very interesting videos up, and I do agree with him on some things on uh, other videos, but as for this, the ones where he goes after Christians, I'm am compelled to defend the faith and um, I'm sure he these answers won't suit him and many of his followers and uh, they may not be the right answers these are just my answers as I see them from my understanding and now having said that um, here goes question one the Bible tells us that God sacrificed His only Son so that we could go to heaven. But the Bible also tells us that He raised His Son back from the dead again. If God didn't really lose His Son, then how is that a sacrifice? Isaiah 53. We'll go down here. I'll save you all the poetry. Read it, please. Go down to six. See verse six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison, and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in the death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. When you can understand how Isaiah knew Jesus would come to be, then you will understand the answer to question one. Question two. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful and has everything under control, why does he keep asking for money every Sunday? God does not ask for money every Sunday. However, the tithe is there for a purpose. You have a problem with giving money to the poor, to the widows and to the orphans? Well, then don't tithe. Question 3. The Bible tells us that God regretted making Saul king. 
But if that's the case, doesn't that mean God didn't know the future? Because if he knew he was going to regret making Saul king, he would have never done it in the first place. Would have never done it in the first place. You got that from 1 Samuel, did you? Well, I think you need to go back a bit and read a little more before the story. And we'll see. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And up here, verse 6, uh, the people were crying for Samuel to give them a king. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day wherein they have forsaken me and served other gods. So do they also unto thee. He goes on down here and says, Go ahead and let them have a king, as they ask. But tell them this thing first. Okay, go on down here. Uh, go to verse 11. And he said, Thus will be the manner of the king that shall reign over thee. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to his horsemen, and, the, and some shall be run before the chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to eat his, to air his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to the confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers and he will make take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards even the best of them and give them to the servants he will take the tenth of the seed of your vine yard and give to his officers and to his servants he will take your minutes man servant and your maid servant and your good goodly, goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work he will take the tenth of your sheep and he, it just goes on and on here about what a king will do to you. Why you don't want a king. But I'm going to give you a king anyway. Did God know that Saul would mess up? Yes. Apparent that God knew this. God let them have a king. Because they wanted a king over him. So they got a king. They got a king, all right. Not a little long, long line, a succession of kings that messed things up. Because they wanted a government like all the other nations. When all they needed was God to follow his ordinances. But no. can't have all those things by doing that. Question 4 If every complex design requires a designer, who designed God? <laughs> the who designed God question. Oh my God. Who designed That question is too stupid to even try to answer. Uh, God's not a thing. The Bible clearly says God's a spirit. There's things which need to be created. Okay. Question five. If nothing can come from nothing, then how did God create the universe out of nothing? The Bible doesn't say he created the universe out of nothing. He just said it was formless and void. And formless and void is not nothing. Question 6 
If something can come from nothing, why do we need God to create the universe? Might as well ask, why do we need a universe? Question 7. If everyone who ever lived prior to Jesus could get into heaven by simply believing God, like Abraham did, doesn't that make Jesus a little superfluous? Abraham didn't just believe in God. He did as God told him. Question 8. The Bible tells us that God isn't willing that anybody should perish, but His Holy Word has been corrupted through the ages by mankind. So doesn't that mean God either allowed it to be corrupted, or He was unable to keep it from being corrupted? Who says it's corrupted? The message is still there intact. The Dead Sea Scrolls, word for word with Isaiah. The other books that are found. Who says it's corrupted? Oh yeah, there are several bad versions of the Bible. And there are people that try to corrupt the Word. And there are apostates like the Catholic Church, the Popes, the Papacy. The Papacy. The Popes are not Christian. And they pervert the Word. They twist the Word. But uh, if I remember right, there were people uh, like Tisdale, that preserved the Word, and uh, their attempts at destroying the Word failed. The Word still exists and is still intact. It's not corrupted, but men are corrupt. And the way men use it is a corrupting thing. They misuse it. Question 9. In the book of James, God instructs Christians on what they should do when they get sick. They're supposed to pray and lay hands on the sick person, and God promises to heal them. So why do you ignore God's command and run to science every time you get sick? I swear, when you're sick, you seek a physician. When your body is sick, you seek a physician. When your spirit is sick, does a physician help? Oh, and as for the laying on the hands, uh, there are people that still do this uh, in, the, in the hospital. And um, there is a doctor that actually did a study on this and found that laying on hands are those patients who had others come and lay hands on them and pray over them did have a higher recovery rate, a faster recovery rate. So that one right there is simply lack of knowledge. Question 10. The Bible tells us that Jesus threw a huge temper tantrum in the Jewish temple. He actually made a whip and whipped these people and drove them out of the temple, but not before overturning their tables and spilling their money everywhere. The Bible also tells us that Jesus called a Canaanite woman a dog. And Jesus insulted the Pharisees by calling them derogatory names at every turn. Jesus also lied to his own disciples. They asked him if he was going to the feast. He said, no, my time's not yet come. And he turns around and goes to the feast. Jesus also condones slavery. And he did not denounce the crimes of rape or pedophilia. Not only that, Jesus taught that if you call somebody a fool, you were in danger of going to hell. Then he turns around and calls several people fools. Not only that, the Bible tells us that Jesus explicitly upheld the ghastly Mosaic law that required children to be killed if they became unruly. Is this the person we should be emulating? No face on this one. Your last question had several parts in a rant. I have to break that down into pieces. All right, um, on your brother, Rika, is 
not the same as calling a fool a fool. The Pharisees are the very people that you hate already. They're the religious nut jobs that use and twist the words of God. They rule more with tradition and seek fame and like the high spot that they're put in because of their priestly positions. But they weren't priests. They weren't of the tribe of Levi. Uh, they were all deceivers and they were all fools. So Christ called it as they were. As for making a whip and chasing the thieves out of God's temple, Jesus did was clean house. That's not a crime. As far about lying to his disciples, there you have a mess up in their memories of the, the witnesses. That, and it was the next day of the feast. The feast lasts more than one day. And um, a bit about. Uh, not speaking against rape and such. He's never talked about rape and pedophilia. That was not even in there. However, he believed in those Levitical laws you talk about, which were both opposed to those things. And has all for the unruly child. This was after three Cries, and this child had to be very unruly. And at those days, in those days, the father would have been held responsible for the actions of the unruly child. And uh, you know what the punishment for many of the crimes was back then was pretty brutal. So if your child went over and robbed the neighbor's house and was caught in the act, uh, the father would be the one going to prison for it. That would then cause a hardship in the rest of the family because the man was the breadwinner and the one that brought home the food and the money to the house. So by not dealing with this unruly child severely after several, several attempts at reforming the child he had much choice in the matter. Yes. To save his whole family. Yes. What is wrong? No problem with that. After all, they were living under much different circumstances than we do today. With much different attitudes about things than we have today and your liberal sensibilities just did not fit in that world that does not make what was going on wrong for that world and I don't know of any Christian today that stones anyone or even calls for the stoning of anyone Christ came not for the ones who were saved. He didn't come for those who already knew God and were living according to the law of God. He didn't come for them. He came for you. He came to save you. But you reject Him. I will pray for you. Have a good day, everybody. Peace, love, and understanding. I'll be with you.